Well, hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We're kind of uh, really rolling now into the new year, aren't we? Uh, we're, we're getting past that point where we keep saying Happy New Year and even past the point where a lot of the conversations are reviewing 2017. At this point, we got enough time into 2018. It feels like we're in the new year. Markets feel that way as well. It's been a pretty extraordinary start to the year. Equities continued their significant advance that we've already seen this year, uh, more so this week. A little more volatility, uh, meaning big move up Tuesday, followed by a big move down all in the same day, but then a big move up on Wednesday, biggest day of the year that actually held. And then we've kind of been bouncing around here on Thursday as we're taping. The point I want to make is that at this point, we're really kind of ready for 2018 to, to come into its own as earnings season is underway and, and companies are laying out their forecast for the year. This includes everything from how they anticipate tax reform uh, impacting them. They report kind of their organic results from late 2017, which of course wouldn't have had any tax reform implications baked in at all. And just in terms of uh, a lot of the company's internal projections that are even outside of the the tax impact, but more strategically, more um, balance sheet driven, and just kind of where the the health of their their business may be. So we're starting to get a feel for that. And and I'm liking a lot of what I'm seeing thus far. It's been a heavy week of research and positioning. So there are a couple of macro themes I want to go into. I kind of want you to listen to the Dividend Cafe podcast this week or read DividendCafe.com either way because there's some there's some themes I'm not getting into here in the video that are just sort of more um, evergreen. I think they're really permanently important that that help, that hold out our, our philosophy about how we're kind of approaching the, the priciness of markets and that opportunity and what we think about the sort of timing aspect of things. Um, it is it is dangerous right now to try to time conservatively. It's dangerous to try to time aggressively. What is not dangerous in our estimation, and by dangerous I mean not threatening to one's long-term financial health, is to stick to an allocation that has been well-reasoned, well-balanced, well-structured, and takes into account the very specificity of one's own investment objectives around liquidity and cash flow and so forth. So I said I wasn't going to get into it. I started to get into it. So let me back off of that. The, the things I kind of want to focus on here have to do with our sort of sector attractiveness. We talked about what we think in terms of asset classes, stocks, bonds, um, things like that. But I think when you drill down into the equity market, I truly believe this is an important year to understand the rotations that are likely to take place, to understand the changes in leadership uh, as to what will be driving a lot of market returns and where there may be opportunity for relative uh, value added in, port in our portfolio management be because of the way that we weight certain uh, positions in certain sectors. I do believe that it will look very different in 2018 than 2017 in terms of what sectors are driving a lot of returns. You know, we talk about how well the financials have done since the Trump administration uh, both because of the deregulatory relief that's come out of a lot of the more onerous issues in Dodd-Frank, but also out of the Federal Reserve. Um, not only different personnel there, but also um, in concert with Treasury Department, a different focus on capital buffers that I think just provides a little more leeway, particularly in the small and mid-level banks, uh, to expand kind of some of their profit-making activities. Well, that, a lot of that is very priced into the market. Um, so to the extent that one goes, we're bullish on financials, I think that they have to recognize that a lot of the theses that they're sharing are legitimate, but we don't know exactly how much has already been priced in. The bank sector was up 48%. So you have, you have a lot of that. It's already moved. I would argue that there are still areas in the financial sector that have not been priced in. We look at some of the asset managers that are not balance sheet sensitive, and we've been saying this for a while. They've had a move up, but nowhere near the participation in this rally. So to the degree you have strong brand names, strong dividend yields, strong uh, organic cash flow growth, and great leadership 
it would seem to me that they also will benefit from some of the deregulatory efforts with the present personnel and yet have not seen that fully priced in the markets. But, you know, I go through in Dividend Cafe this week, kind of our outlook sector by sector, what some of the bullish arguments may be and bearish arguments and kind of what our uh, actionable conclusions are in our portfolio management. And, and you know, we've talked a lot in the past about our old tech versus cool tech theme. And, and I believe that that's extremely valid. And in fact, playing out already, we've even added new positions already this year. Um, you look at the REIT sector and the real estate investment trust have not performed well. Uh, there's always a sort of short team, short term correlation to interest rates. And so our thesis is that this is an opportunity where there could be select picking to do in the REIT sector, where indeed the overall uh, pressure in the space has hurt some names given a lower valuation where actually longer term, we don't think that those headwinds will maintain. Let's use the interest rate example. Interest rates going higher because of cyclical growth in the economy could bode very well for a lot of the, the REIT sector. In the short term, it may seem that the income they kick off is less valuable because of higher interest rates that are available in the marketplace. But then when you consider the fact that the rates are going higher because of good growth in the economy, that makes those underlying businesses more valuable and drives the possibility for dividend increases. That's not priced in. We think there's value in certain aspects of REITs. It's a contrarian call, which always means that sometimes you have to look bad for a little while, but we think it's a way to, to, to generate value now. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the energy sector right now. I talk about it a lot. I think you know how I feel. Um, but I think that, that more or less we want to be really focused on what pockets are more investable than others. To the extent that the very expensive aspects of the market probably will continue to perform until some risk off sentiment comes in. That is what it is. If people want to try to squeeze more juice out of those already frothy areas, they're welcome to try. It's not what we do. Um, we got to go buy where we think there's value. And, and I think that attempting to time around, that's a very poor idea. So that's the approach we're taking to U.S. equities right now. You do have a chart at DividendCafe.com this week that is really interesting. Every single year, it, it rates the top performing asset classes for that particular year and looks at past years as well. And you see this you know, mixed colors all over because one year small caps down 20% and the next year it's up 40% and, and so forth. And, and what it's intending to really kind of illustrate is the fact that on a year by year basis, you very rarely have consistent smooth performers across the top or across the bottom. Things move all around. And what it's attempting to do, it's not attempting to do it, it's doing it empirically and in a very compelling manner to make the case for asset allocation. Unless one believes that they can pick what asset class will shine best in a given year and what will do worse and so forth, um, it, it is essentially saying that by having a, a well-allocated portfolio of different asset classes, you have the ability to optimize the return profile you're going for in your portfolio relative to the risk profile you're willing to accept. It may sound like a mouthful, but it's very simple. You want to be able to uh, get a maximum rate of return for a level of risk you're comfortable taking on. And by blending in a number of different asset classes, we think we improve our prospects for doing that. But it's, there's a kind of humility that a chart like this forces upon people. Because someone sees a forecast that, oh, last year this emerging markets is down 20%, it's going to be down again. And then they see it up at the top of the chart the next year. And the reality of yesterday's losers often being tomorrow's winners and vice versa and, and at various points in between too. We're not just talking about top to bottom and worst to first kind of movements, but even being a third place performer to a seventh place performer or something like that. The point being that high conviction in investment principles is a very important thing from what we, for what we do. High and stubborn conviction on a specific asset class at a specific time is utter foolishness. The, the market's ability to confound those expectations or delay the achievement of outlook 
happens all the time. So right now we're very focused on that asset allocation. We, I think, have kind of purified it a little bit, meaning we have bonds right now and are preparing even more so for this that are very bond-like in their characteristics. Um, but across the equity side, we want to have that appropriate amount of exposure and we're going to continue trimming. This is an incredible market we're in and we're still looking for chances to peel back a little bit. My defense of this bull market my, my belief that it has a significant possibility of continuing does not mean that I'm not risk conscious. We have a very modest weighting in equities. We're not overweighted. We're peeling off of profits. But my point is, is that those decisions have to be made within a discipline, within an actual investment policy, not based on what we think headlines are going to say or markets are going to do. Sentiment right now is very, very bullish. At some point, that's going to cause us to want to peel back, not add more. Because once you start getting into euphoric levels of bullishness, it generally can churn, not just quickly, but it can churn in, in a significantly negative way. And it's not there yet, but those are the things we're watching. Um, even if video's your thing, I do really encourage you to go to DividendCafe.com. It's one of my favorites in a long time because there's just a lot of charts, a lot of succinct material I think is very easy to understand. More and more people are telling us they like getting the podcast. So we're still doing a podcast talk of Dividend Cafe, basically just kind of transcribing, going through what we've said at DividendCafe.com week by week. It's roughly about 10 minute audio listen. But then AdviceAndInsights.com, doing a longer form podcast, 30 to 45 minutes a week, whole lot of new fresh material. If that's your thing, either you want to um, exercise to me talking about investment markets or more likely you want to go to sleep to me talking about it. Either way, I, I encourage you to check that out. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Big week, a lot going on. Come back at us with questions. We'll cover them next week in the video. Thanks for watching and listening to Dividend Cafe.